Look at that big bee. It's more birds than a big bee. Look at the bird. It's a big bee.
That's not the only thing, Chris. That's true. They <laughs> show what's really down here. Why?
few more giraffes in the far distance. We will travel through East Africa three more times on our tour today. So hopefully we get a better view of all those animals in the distance. There should be one or two on the left-hand side as well, maybe directly below us on the left. Are they climb through this brush? So we have tigers on each side of the train, one in the far right corner. <laughs> And there was one just below us on the left, so those of you on the left can just look out over the edge of the train and maybe see a tiger roaming about down below. Awake and really active, and that's the second reason they're so active. The uh, weather has been really nice and cool, and the tigers prefer this type of environment, keeps them awake. But normally they sleep 16 to 20 hours a day. There he is, there he is. And here's our big guy on the left, right in the open, nice view of that male. His name is Ben Tall. Closer to us, two Ugandan cob antelope. But let's swing back to the left side of the train. <laughs> a really nice view. Well, maybe not the best view of most of our zebra right now. We kind of see the back end. But we get a nice view of the striping by the tail. I always like to talk about it. These are called the Grevy zebra, and they're known for the thumbprint type of pattern right by the tail area. And just like thumbprint patterns, no two zebra striping patterns are alike. Each one is born with unique striping. And that's how we identify our zebra, by the striping in the neck area. And we do have a baby, a young colt in the group. He's the one lying down by himself, just behind the group at the feeder. He's kind of brownish in color. He's two weeks old. Grevy zebra are known for their large, round, Mickey Mouse type ears which they can rotate 180 degrees, pointing them forward and then all the way back. And that has to be their best defense. And let's leave the zebra now and move from Africa to Asia. We're entering the Asian plains. And the animals are really active at this time of day, so you did pick a nice time of day to ride the monorail. The animals are awake and up by the feeding trough closest to us are the Indian sambar deer. You'll find males with antlers and females or does without antlers. There are also a couple of young fawns in this family. Down to the right corner up against the fence line you'll find antelope called the Nilgai antelope. And on the far hillsides, mixture of deer, some with spots, called the Indian Axis deer, and other deer on the far side with big white patches on the rumps. Those are called the Altai Wapiti deer. The left-hand side of the, in, of the uh, train, an enclosure that's built kind of up high like a hillside, and that's because these animals come from the Himalayan plateaus, where their elevations range between 15 and 17,000 feet. So we try to mimic this type of environment for them. They're called kiangs, one type of wild ass. And during the winter months, when there's no food to be found, they have to survive on their body fat. During the spring and summer months, also on the left, the Persian onagers. Back to the right side of the train, you'll find the wild sheep down in the bottom of the enclosure, and also large wild cows called the Indian Gower. There is a baby in the group, the little calf is in the middle of the herd by himself in the sandy wash. And he's about two months old, Indian Gower. They stand close to six feet tall at the shoulder and weigh about 2,000 pounds on adults. About the size of a small car. Back on the left side of the train, we are now entering the Arabian Peninsula, the home of the Arabian Oryx. And when you think of the animal park, you have to think of preservation of endangered species, and the Oryx really sum up what this park is all about. In 1963, they were very close to extinction. There were only nine of them left in the wild. 
They were sent to the United States to start a breeding herd, and since 1963, we have had over 200 calves born in this group alone. We are now sending them back to the wild. At this time, there are approximately 30 Arabian oryx now in Oman and Jordan. So they are starting to rebuild their groups where they were once very, very close to extinction. When they turn their heads to the side, both horns look much like one, and with the white body and horse-like structure, that's where the unicorn myth was thought to have come from. Now as we pass the oryx, we're also going to pass two male rhinos. The first one is Rabha. Second one is going to be Lasai. We're going to stop oh, I got here. Tough, tough we probably won't stop too long, though. <laughs> if you take a big whiff, you'll know why. It's a little bit strong in this area. The first one that we just passed, back where the second car is, his name is Rapa. He's a young male that came to us directly from India. He's an Indian rhinoceros, also called the Greater One Horns. And we transported him on a jumbo jet from India to the United States. He was the only passenger on board in the cargo pen of the, uh, of the jet. The next gentleman is Lasai. Lasai is our oldest Indian rhino. He's close to 30 years old now. He weighs approximately 7,000 pounds. By the way, they do live to be 50 or 60 years old. When you think of rhinos, you probably think of the Indian rhinos, famous for their skin, which looks like armor plating, kind of has a prehistoric look to it. It's only folds of skin about one and a half to two inches thick around the neck. Once again, Indian cower, wild cows, and wild sheep called the Armenian Wild Sheep. We will make a stop here for the mom and calf duo I here. No baby anymore, is it? Believe it or not, this is a young calf with its mama. The mama's the big one. Her name is Gainda. Her baby's name is Gopara. Gopara was born about two years ago. He is the largest baby to be born in the Indian rhino family. He weighed 200 pounds at birth. He was the size of a baby elephant at birth. They usually only weigh about 100 pounds at birth, but he was quite large. Ooh. To give you some comparisons, moms on board, that would be about the size of a 15-pound baby for uh, humans. So he was quite large. The gestation period is 16 to 18 months. Once born, they nurse for two years, drinking about five quarts of their mama's milk a day. Two more down. The uh, calf that's standing and walking, that's uh, Jumia. Jumia is four years old. Her mama is sleeping below us. The one closest to us, her name is Jopori. She gave birth to a uh, Jumia four years ago, and she gave birth to a baby boy a year and a half ago. His name is Joya, and he's lying right against his mama's side. And the father of all these babies, Lasai, the dominant male that we saw back in the there is one black buck antelope, the dark brown antelope, surrounded by the light brown females. And a couple of deer, European, um, excuse me, these are all time Wapiti deer. And that's just about going to do a delineation of the place. We are now leaving Asia and entering East Africa, our largest enclosure, 120. This is one of our youngest animals in the park. There's a Ugandan cob calf. Its mom was just nursing it, and the baby's kind of following behind mom on the right. That baby was born five days ago. It's already bothering mom. Mom's trying to ditch it. And before I talk about the popular giraffe, I'd just like to point out on the left side of the train, we've entered North Africa, the home of our redneck gazelle, also called the Otra gazelle. And they're up on the left hand side of the train. But back to the right hand side. Not only 
only are they popular, but they're pretty special animals, the Beringo giraffe. We have quite a few at the park, and the dominant male is the darkest one in this group, kind of walking away from us now. His name is Blackjack, 18 feet tall, and 20 years old now. They live to be about 30. 35 would be pushing it. You're going to notice Blackjack going to a log. We fill that log, it's hollow, but we fill it up with water every morning, so that's a drinking fountain for the giraffe. It makes it easier for them to drink standing up rather than having to bend over and drink from the pond. We also feed them standing up at the giraffe snack bars. We grow acacia trees and hang those from the snack bar and also give them alfalfa. You will notice a baby at the snack bar now next to its mom. We've had four born this year. And what's interesting about the birth is that moms usually give birth standing up. And because they're so tall, it's a close to a six foot drop into reality for the baby giraffe, head first. The drop serves three purposes. It snaps the umbilical cord, it gets the blood flowing, and it helps the kid to take his first breath. They stand close to six feet tall at birth. Well, they have to be, because of the spacing from the ground to mom's belly, they have to be tall enough to nurse. Those are the Beringo giraffe. Surrounding them are Roosevelt's gazelle. And directly below us, there are two vultures that belong to the park. You'll see one right by the rock and the one walking on the roadway. Those are called white-backed vultures. And like all the vultures, ooh, and there's the giraffe as well. Nice view of the giraffe here. <laughs> They're demonstrating how they pick up food from the ground. It's kind of an awkward position for them to spread their forelegs like that. Not only is it awkward, it kind of throws them off balance. You see, the giraffe has such a long neck and such a big heart that they have to pump a lot of blood up that neck up to their brains. When they bend over like that, it kind of throws their equilibrium off when they pick their heads back up and look around. They usually stand there for a few seconds and I believe it's just trying to focus their eyeballs and get a good view and then they start to move on. No two giraffe spotting patterns are alike, just like our fingerprints, just like zebra striping. Each giraffe born with unique spotting patterns. And they have been hunted through the years for their coats, for sport, and also for their long tails, which unfortunately have been sold throughout the world as fly swatters. It was thought to be a sign of royalty and wealth to own a giraffe or even a wildebeest tail and use it as a fly swatter. A really nice view of them. They rarely come up to this section, usually only at this time of day, so you did take a nice time to ride. And back on the left side, I don't want to miss them. There are some scimitar horn oryx up on the hill. So you can look over your left shoulder and find them. On this log and surrounding the vulture, the marabou stork, and also all the white birds. Those are three motors native to California. Those are cattle shirts and sit a tongue to antelope on the That's why you do it in East Africa until the end of the tour. Back on the left side in North Africa, look for the big rhinoceros that's sleeping by himself. Nice profile view of Dinka, and he represents the most endangered of all the rhinos, the northern white rhinoceros. There are only about 30 of those left in the world. Hunted for the obvious reason for their horn. And Dinka has two horns. The top one is 20 inches long, the bottom one about 24 inches long. He weighs close to 7,000 pounds. Behind Dinka, two Angolian cattle and also a few dromedary or one hump camels. The Angolian cattle are thought to be the ancestors to our own Texas longhorns. We have a mixture of animals and birds. You'll find a couple of South African ostrich on the right side of our tray. There is one male and one female near us. The male is jet black, the female is gray. And if you've never seen an ostrich egg before, they're quite large. They're about the size of a cantaloupe. They usually weigh three to five pounds. If you were to scramble one ostrich egg, you could feed a family of 10 with it. It takes 42 days for the ostrich egg to hatch after it's been laid. And they do have a unique nesting system where all the females lay their eggs into one nest. The dominant hen sits on the eggs during the day. The dominant male sits on the eggs at night, which is interesting considering the color of the feathers. 
helps to protect and camouflage the nest 24 hours a day. So the females are on the eggs during the daytime, the black male on the eggs at night. And surrounding the ostrich, many animals like the black wildebeest, the Patterson's eland antelope, they look like big steers, and closer to us, the sable antelope at the feeders. There are many young calves in the sable antelope family. You'll see two young ones close to us, and then two babies way out in the middle, out by the zebra herd. The sable antelope tend to give birth all at the same time. It's called simultaneous calving, which is really helpful if they're out in the wild because the more calves you have all at one time, the better chance it is that most of the calves will survive. And the coloring of the coat is a light lavender, almost a purplish tint to the coat. We have a few babies in that family too. We also have a baby in the kudu family, which is directly below us. I'll try to find the baby as we move through here. There are two big pigs over there. Those are wild boars. Look over by Del Chica, which is a deer. He's a goat. She doesn't seem too impressed. <laughs> There is one walking down the hill, left side of the hill, just above eye level. And then there's a couple just right out by the front of the monorail, if you look all the way up front and then to the left, just out at up, which hooks over the bottom lip, kind of a funny little hook to the lip. When he lifts his head, he may be able to see that. It's amazing to me that people would even consider killing these animals, but they have been hunted through the years for their coats, for sport, and often for their tails, as I might have mentioned earlier, which were sold as fly swatters in many parts of the world. Once again, it's a sign of royalty and wealth to own one of those tails. You can look at their spotting patterns. No two spotting patterns are alike. In fact, each species of giraffe is different because of the spotting pattern. The Baringo giraffe kind of have a kind of a jigsaw type of... Uh, oh, look at the smile and everything. Ashley! Ashley! Okay, now take a picture here.